coming back to the heart of worship It's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing For the last couple of weeks, I've been teaching on knowing what's inside of ourselves. When we're born again, we have to know what's deposited into our lives. And what's inside of us, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, His Spirit enters into our life. And when the Holy Spirit enters into our life, He brings with Him so many good and perfect gifts. Matter of fact, James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of Lights. The Father of Lights is the Father in Heaven, and His Spirit is the, comes down through Him into us. And every good and perfect gift is deposited into our hearts when we're born again. And these are the seeds that the Holy Spirit sows into our heart. Through the Holy Spirit's presence, we have so many, good and get, so many good perfect gifts. And actually, some of these gifts are known as the fruit of the Spirit, which is found in Galatians 5. Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we're born again, these are all deposited into our hearts because they come, they're the fruit of the Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, He brings these seeds that are planted into our hearts. And as these seeds are planted into our hearts, they germinate, they grow. And the more they're looked after, the more they grow into that fruit. During the first two weeks of the series titled, What's Inside? I've shown you that as the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, He comes in for a very specific reason and a very specific purpose. And that we found that what that purpose is when we looked at the original Greek of what the word for the definition for the helper is. And the word for the definition of helper in, in Greek is parakletos, which is the English word paraclete. And parakletos, in the, the definition in the Greek means one who is summoned or called to one's aid. He's called to one's side. So the Holy Spirit is given to us to walk with us so that we can have somebody that's walking with us and giving us aid and comfort in every facet of our life. That's why Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm sending you my helper, my spirit, myself. I'm going to dwell inside of you because I'm not going to leave you alone. Praise God. Praise God. See, the purpose for the Holy Spirit entering into our life is to provide aid for each one of us. It's to provide guidance. It's to provide the, the, each believer with the fullness of what Jesus came to give us. The Holy Spirit helps in our times of need. You know, last week I showed you how you're filled with the strength of God. And you're filled with the strength of God when you worship, when you pray, and then when you meditate on the Word of God. These three things Jesus demonstrated in His life on earth when He got alone to be by Himself with the Father. He'd get alone, get on His knees, He'd worship God, He'd pray to Him, and then He would just, He was the Word of God, so He meditated in Himself. Oh, to be glorious, to meditate in yourself if you're the Word of God, what a glorious thing that could be. But you see, we have the Word of God given to us so that we can meditate on who Jesus Christ is. Amen? And we saw how to be filled with the joy of the Lord, that joy is actually the fruit of the Spirit. And when we're filled with joy of the Lord, that the joy of the Lord then provides us strength. As Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when we are worshiping God, when we're praying to Him, when we're on our face in front of Him, and we're going ahead and, and, and reading the Word of God, when we're into His Word, we're getting filled with joy. We're, we're developing that fruit of joy in our lives. And as we are, we're getting strengthened by the Word of God. Amen? Amen. When you're feeling tormented, the best thing you can do is go to your quiet place. Just go to your quiet place and get along with God. Just like that song I just sang for you for the callback. There's a place where you can go where you'll never be alone. You'll never be alone. You, you, you know, we, look, we long for people to hold on to. We long for relationships in our life. We long for different things to fill us. But God is saying, I'm filling you if you just come and surrender your life to me. You'll never be alone. And I've given you everything you need. You have to develop the fruit that's deposited into your life. Today I'm going to be continuing the series as we look at the next benefit of what is deposited into a heart. And it's actually the next benefit or the next fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. You know, in today's age, this is something that escapes a lot of people. The peace of God. So pray with me. Because I've got a lot to share with you this morning. And I encourage you to write notes, get your Bibles out, get your highlighters out, because I'm going to give you a lot of information this morning. Take notes, because this is going to help you to, have, to be able to walk in the fullness of God's peace in your life. Amen? Pray with me, if you would. Father God, I thank you that you've given us the ability, Lord, to come into the fullness of who you are. That, Lord, we don't have to be alone. That we can walk with you. We can be in you, and you are as you are in us. 
and that, Lord, you desire to fill us with the fullness of who you are, with the fullness of your peace, your love, and just your perfect will for our lives. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you right now that you open our eyes to see the truth of who you are. You open our ears, Lord God, to receive that truth. And you open our hearts, Lord, to receive the seeds that are planted into our life, that that seed would germinate, would gather, would grow, and, and nourish and produce a fertile crop of over a hundredfold. Be glorified in our lives, Lord, as we bring you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. What is peace? Do you know that for a majority of people, this is an emotion or a feeling or a state of mind that escapes people. In the hustle and bustle of life and in this world, I mean, let's face it, look what's going on in this world today. Look what's going on in this world today. Why is what's going on in this world going on? Well, there's a devil out there that's desiring to kill everybody and to destroy everything he can. When we look at peace, we, we, we tend to see people going through the opposite of what peace is. You can turn on your TV and see a list of commercials for drugs treating anxiety, depression, and various other emotional issues. Do you know that these issues of anxiety, depression, and emotional issues are also they're, they're a direct result of an absence of peace from your life? Because if you have peace in your life, you're not going to be anxious. If you have peace in your life, you're not going to be depressed. If you have peace in your life, you're not going to be full of turmoil. You're going to be at peace. In order to understand, though, we have to, what, how to become and, and filled with peace, we also have to know what peace is. I'm going to give you the worldly definition by Webster, who is the authority on definitions. Webster says peace is a state of tranquility or quiet. Well, if you've got little kids running around the house, that is just something that we crave, isn't it? <laughs> I need that quiet. Quiet! But according to Webster, it's a state of tranquility. It's knowing, understanding how to be happy. In other words, be at peace with yourself. In this day, when's the last time that you've truly felt tranquil and secure? When's the last time that you felt there wasn't a worry in the world? You know, there's not many people that walk that way. And the reason is, it's because there's such an evil out there that John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes but to steal and to destroy and to kill and to destroy. He wants to steal your health and joy. He wants to kill your body and he wants to destroy your relationship with God. This is what the thief does in John 10.10. 10. Steal your health kill your body, destroy your relationship with God in the process. That's his whole purpose. And how does he destroy your relationship with God? He begins by destroying your peace. See, if the devil can steal your peace and your joy, he can take everything from you that you have. Jerry Savelle wrote a book years ago it's called that if the devil can't steal your joy, he can't keep your goods. It's a very good book because it tells you that if you're losing your joy, the devil's got you right where he wants you because he's going to go ahead and cause all kinds of havoc in your life. And why? When you're upset, when you're anguished, that's when you're at your weakest point. That's when you're at your weakest point. Let's look at what the Greek definition is, though, for what peace is. The Greek word for peace in the Bible is Irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. Irene means security, safety, prosperity, felicity, because peace and harmony make and keep things safe and prosperous. Do you see that? Peace and harmony keep you safe and prosperous. When we look at, the pro, at what the products of peace are, we begin to see the importance. Safe means to be secure from the threat of danger. Prosperous means to be enjoying vigorous and healthy growth. Now, I need you to hear me on this, church. This is a, a very important teaching I'm giving you today. If you're wondering, why am I not growing deeper in God? The first question you have to ask yourself is, where am I with my peace? Am I established in the peace of God Am I rooted deeply in his presence? Because if I'm in turmoil, there's no way for you to possibly be able to be secure and to grow vigorously. The only way you're going to be able to grow vigorously and, and be prosperous in the word of God is when you're planted firmly in his peace. When we look deeper into these two products of being safe and prosperous, the presence of God produces security in our life. The presence of God produces safety in our life. And through that safety, then he enables us then to grow into the fullness of who he is. Amen? Amen? When you know that you're secure and safe, is there anything that can come against you that can push you off of who you are? When you know that there is nothing that can harm you, let me give you an analogy. Let's say you're surrounded by the National Guard. 
Okay? And they all have their weapons drawn and they're surrounding you with their weapons drawn to protect you. Are you going to be worried about one person that comes up against you? Are you going to be worried about five people that come up against you? No. The reason why is because you're established in a perimeter of safety. You're secure. Do you know that we don't even realize that we have legions of angels that surround each one of us in our daily life? We can't see them, but they're there. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses is what the Bible tells us. A great cloud of witnesses. We're surrounded by the mighty protection of God Almighty because he said, He who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of my protection. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say he is my fortress and my refuge. My God in him I will trust. We're protected by the fortress and the refuge of God Almighty when we dwell in his perfect peace and his presence. Amen? In the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, Jesus taught, we're not going to go there with the scriptures today, by the way, but in the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, Jesus taught a parable on the four types of ground. The, stone, the hard ground, the stony ground, the ground with briars and thorns, and then the good fertile ground. Now, I taught a series on this called Godly Farming, Biblical Keys to Spiritual Growth. And it's on our website. And if you want to understand more about the parable of Mark 4 for biblical growth, pick it up and listen to it. There's another foundation in that parable, though, that Jesus taught about. And it has to do with what kind of ground are we standing on? Now, stay with me on this, because I promise you, you're going you're to get something out of this this morning. See, when we look at the four types of grounds, it's important that we have a firm foundation that we're standing on. Because if you're standing on kind of ground that's uneven or unlevel or rocky or, or upset or, or even quicksand, is it possible that you're going to be safe and secure? No. You've got to have a good, firm foundation. Now, one of the reasons that this is so important is because we have a, a way of life that the Bible tells us about that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we're walking on ground that's shaky, are we going to be secure and safe in our hearts? So what are we going to be speaking out of our mouth? Fear, disbelief, doubt. All these things are going to come out of us. Now, if we're standing on firm foundation, and we know that we're planted deep, and we have this peace and secure safety around us, what's going to come out of our heart? You with me? Okay. If you want to know what someone really believes, spend a few minutes with them outside of church, and just listen to what they say. What's going to happen is when you're talking about people that are walking, that, 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 that want to walk on the firm, fertile ground of God, but they're, they're professing doom, gloom, and doubt in their words, what they're actually doing is they're walking on unsettled soil. Now, I know I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but stay with me, because I am going to pull this together. Matthew 12, 37 says, by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. If we're standing on ground that is not capable of giving us a found, firm foundation, we're going to be speaking out negative aspects of our life, correct? Out of your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. So we're producing doom and gloom in our own life. There is no way that you can have the peace of God in your life if you're confessing doubt, lack, fear, and unbelief. It's impossible. You can't profess one thing and expect to live something else. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever somebody's saying, this is truly what's in their heart. This is why it's so important that we get into a firm and fertile foundation with our life. Now this brings us back to the parables. There are four types of ground that Jesus talked about. It was the hard ground, the rocky ground, the ground with briars and thorns, and then the fertile ground. Now relating to our peace, hard ground. Hard ground was built by someone's heart to keep themselves separated from everybody else. In other words, it's, it refers to a hardened heart. Now, if somebody has a hardened heart and they're walking with just this coldness and they're keeping everybody else out, are they going to be in a life of peace? It's impossible. Because if, you're, if you've got a wall built up, you're afraid of everything that's trying to come against you. Do you know what? We tend to build walls to keep people out. You know what we actually do? We build walls to keep ourselves in prison. A fortress, when we build, we think, well, I built this because I've got to keep myself safe. And what you're doing is you're keeping yourself hostage. You see the world going on out there, everybody having fun, and you're trapped in your little 8 by 8 room because you're afraid of what's going on out there. You build this wall to keep yourself separated from what's going on. There's no way to be totally at peace. No way to have the full peace of God in your heart. Because you're not secure. You're not safe. You think you are, 
but you're really not. If you build a wall keeping yourself in prison, you think you're secure and safe, what you're actually doing is you're actually holding yourself hostage. You're holding yourself in bondage. The primary reason that people build a wall, though, is because they don't have the peace of God in their life. They don't have that security. They don't have that safety. They don't have the, uh, uh, the foundation of knowing that everything's okay. They're worried, fear, doubt, unbelief. These different things come in. When you have a hard ground, nothing can penetrate that ground. It rains, the water even drops off. It's kind of like rain falling on concrete. Is there any possible way that things can penetrate the concrete? Well, only if it's cracked, and then possibly. But you see, hard ground is meant not to produce life. It's meant to keep a cap on death. So it's important that we, we make sure we're grounded in the peace of God. The second type of ground was the rocky or stony ground. Have you ever taken a walk on rocky or stony ground? Do you know, our oldest daughter used to live in Savannah. And we'd go down to the riverfront. And the riverfront was built hundreds of years ago. And they have these cobblestones in the riverfront. And you try to walk on those because they're uneven, it's very easy to roll your ankle. You don't have a good, firm foundation. And there were times when we'd see people driving on them and their cars bouncing up and down because the rocky ground is so hard. It's so rocky. See, rocky ground, it's impossible to get a good, firm foundation. It's impossible to, to, to feel secure in your walk. So if you're walking on rocky or, or stony ground, is it possible to have peace in your life? If you're in a rocky relationship, is it possible to have peace in your life? If you're in a rocky situation, if your job's uncertain, are you, is it possible to have peace in your life? It's possible, right? But is, is it likely? Is it likely? When you're focused on the rocky ground, is it possible? Okay, let me rephrase that. Thank you, helper. Okay. <laughs> So the third type of ground we look at is the briars and thorns. Now, the briars and thorns, they represent when we focus on the cares of the world. Now, I'm taking this parable and I'm trying to relate it to you with the importance of having peace in our life. Because when we're walking, if we're focused on the cares of the world, what's going to happen when we're looking around? And we're not focused on where we're going. We're not focused on who's directing us. We're not focused on our inside witness, our, our Holy Spirit that's guiding us. When we're focused on the cares of the world, we're going to run into things. We're going to run into obstacles because the cares of the world are going to eat our lunch. That's also the danger with the briars and the thorns. Now, the fourth type of ground that Jesus referred to was the good and fertile ground. The good and fertile ground is the ground that actually you can rest on. It gives you a good foundation. Things grow out of it. Now, where am I going with this? It's a good question. Where I'm going with this is very important. In Ephesians 6, Paul talked about the armor of God. And in Ephesians 6, he said to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. The shoes of the gospel of peace. Now, if you're standing on any of these other types of ground that is un that's not good and fertile, are you going to be able to get a good, firm footing where you are. And you're not going to get a good firm fit. You may sound that you say that you can with the hard ground because it's hard, but when I tell you what the shoes of the gospel of peace actually were created, you're going to see that it's impossible. The shoes that the Roman soldier wore, and I did a 10-week series out there called the armor of God, and I broke each, each piece of the armor down. The shoes of the gospel of peace, the shoes of the, of the, armor, uh, that, of the armor of God that Paul wrote about, of the Roman soldier weren't sandals like you see in the TV shows. The shoes of the Roman soldier had between one and three inch spikes coming out of the bottom of them. They were there for giving them a good solid footing where if somebody came to push them, they couldn't push. They were like golf shoes on steroids, okay? You dig in, you can't be moved. Now, if you have spikes on your shoes and you come into hard concrete ground, what happens to those spikes? You're gonna slide all over the place, right? Right, you get into rocky ground, they're not gonna dig in. Thorny ground, well, they'll come and grab your legs. So you need to have that good, fertile ground. Now, Paul told us in Ephesians 6 to put on, he says, having gird your feet, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When Paul gave us the armor, he was chained to a Roman soldier in the prison for days and days and weeks and months. He'd see every piece of the armor of the soldier, and so he used the letter in Ephesians to go ahead and show you that God gave us spiritual weapons based on the worldly weapons, the worldly armor. 
The shoes of the Roman soldier were actually set to be a very firm offensive and defensive weapon. See, the gospel of peace is what enables us to dig firm and to be planted in the truth of what God says we have. Now, if you're planted firm in the truth of what God says you have, and something tries to come against you, is it going to be able to push you and slide you away? Not if you got those spikes on. Have you, anybody uh, ever gone and tried to play golf with regular tennis shoes on? I'd made the mistake of doing that once. The ground was a little wet. I swung, down I went. Because I had no footing. It, it was like a comedy thing of the Keystone Cops. You know, I went to take a swing, and I'm dating myself there, but I took a swing with the golf club, and my shoes just went out from under me, and down I went. The reason that you have those spikes on the golf shoes is to give you that, that footing so that your feet will dig into the ground. Now, imagine golf shoes on steroids, as I said. One to three inch spikes coming out of the shoes. That's what the gospel of peace does. It allows us to dig into our surroundings and not be moved by what's going on around us. This is where the peace of God comes in. The peace of God enables us that regardless of the windstorms that are going around us, we're able to plant firm and not be moved. This is the peace of God. The gospel of peace. We're living in times that I have never seen in my entire life that have been more serious than what they are right now. I'm older than some of you. I'm younger than some of you. But in my 55 years, I've lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War. I've lived through the events that took place, the riots, the race wars, everything that went on in this country for the last 55 years I've experienced. But I haven't seen anything with what's going on in our world in my entire life than what I see today. This shows me that the devil knows his time on this earth is coming to an end because he's amped up his attacks to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This also shows me the need for each one of us to be more grounded in the peace of God now than ever before. Do you know that there is a, the, the, the higher risk of terrorism going on in this world right now? Do you know what the whole purpose of terrorism is? To cause terror, to get your peace stolen so that they can push you all over the place, get you to run in fear. God didn't call us to be afraid. He said, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and a sound mind. So this whole terrorism that's coming against us, it's just a, a, a tool from the devil that's trying to go ahead and cause as much destruction on this earth. See, the devil knows that if he can get you to fear, he's going to get your peace torn up. And if your peace is torn up, you're going with it. It's important that we have to go ahead and dig into the peace. In John 14, Jesus said, when the Helper the Holy Spirit, whom the Father has sent in my name, will teach you all things. He'll bring to remembrance all things I said to you. Then Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. How many people live their life with their heart in trouble? With their heart in fear? What are we going to do? I don't know what's going to happen. What's going to happen? Oh, well, we, we all need to be packing because I tell you what, you walk down the street and somebody could pull out a gun. There's so much things going on that steal our peace and our joy because we focus on the world situations. But Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives you. What is the peace that Jesus gave us? It's the Holy Spirit that is inside of us. The Holy Spirit, God's paraclete, who is called to one's aid. Now I'm going to show you how we live in the peace of God. Colossians chapter 3. Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, Paul gave us an outline of how to live in the peace of God. I'm going to break this, this down. I'm going to read the first, this whole passage for you. Then we're going to break it down, and I'm going to give you five points that Colossians 3 tells us about. And, 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 yeah, I can't talk. Five points that Colossians tells us about in order to have peace grounded firmly in our life. And I promise you, you get this, you can live your life without fear. You can live your life without turmoil. You can live your life without anxiousness, without depression, without anxiety, and all the other garbage that the devil tries to throw at us. Amen? Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, 
Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Underline that. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To which you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In this passage of Colossians, we're given a blueprint of a five-point plan on how to walk in the fullness of God's peace active in your heart. You ready to receive this? First point. Living in the peace of God, the first point you have to do is understand that you are the elect of God. The elect of God. Now, a lot of people use this passage and say, well, God is predestined. See, the elect of God? God no. God predestined everybody to be saved. That's why Jesus said that, God said, you know, the word says that he came, that not one should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God's predestined everybody to be saved, but people choose not to be. When you are saved, you are the elect of God. When you're the elect of God, those are Christians who have obtained salvation through the finished work of Christ on the cross. Christians who have obtained salvation through the finished work of Christ on the cross. Through that salvation, you've received the Spirit of Christ in your heart. The Holy Spirit. The first point in understanding this as the elect of God is that you already have it inside of you. You have the Spirit of Christ inside of you. That's the first point. The second point then tells us to put on the garment of the fruit of the Spirit. We see here in verses 12 through 14, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Doesn't that sound like I'm describing what's in Galatians 5? The fruit of the Spirit. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another, walking in love. If anyone has a complaint against each other, even as Christ forgave you, so you also do. But above, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. To put on, in this means, to be clothed with, to adorned in a garment. Paul said to put on tender mercies. In other words, to be clothed with tender mercies, to be adorned in a garment. Tender mercies, the fruit of the Spirit, are all a garment of the Spirit of Christ. We're to put it on. Now, if something can be put on, can it also be taken off? Absolutely. So it's important that we put on the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit of Christ. See, when you come to the understanding inside of yourself that you are God's chosen vessel, first of all, and you're forever transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then you understand that that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of you. You're able to put on all the fullness of who the Holy Spirit is. And when you put on the fullness of who the Holy Spirit is, you're actually wrapping yourself in the garment of the presence of God. Whew. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Visualize putting on the Spirit of Christ. Visualize the Lord just wrapping himself around you. When the Lord has wrapped himself around you, is there any way that you're going to feel anxious? Is there any way you're going to feel fear, rejection, any kind of other issues in your life that are going to steal your peace? No. You're putting on the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit. See, I, I showed you last couple weeks that we have to tend to our gardens. When we're born again, the fruit of the Spirit is planted into each of our hearts, the seeds. But we have to nurture these seeds. We have to grow them into the full crop. And how do we nurture and, and grow these seeds? We nurture and grow these seeds by spending time in the garden. Visualize Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where he normally went to pray. Jesus, I, I, I told you this last week, I, I see the Garden of Gethsemane as one of Jesus' secret places where he went to be alone with the, God, with the Father with the Holy Spirit and the Father. He tended to his garden. We have to do that daily in our lives. And I showed you last week that when you worship God, when you pray and meditate on his word, that the presence of the Holy Spirit then is ignited in your heart. 
And when the presence of the Holy Spirit is ignited, He just fills you with the fullness of who He is. That's good stuff, isn't it? See, you got to put on the fruit of His presence. And after you put on the garment of His fruit, you've got to walk and live in it. To walk and living in the fruit of the Spirit is actually godliness. And it's demonstrated as we forgive others. Paul said, forgive. You'll be forgiven. Jesus said that too. All through the Bible, we see that you can't be forgiven if you first don't forgive. That's walking in godliness. And then he's told us to put on the full measure of love, which is the bond of perfection. The bond of perfection means that it's, the, it's, the signum, it's significant of your maturity in Christ, to walking in love. But that only comes when we spend time in the garden, meditating, in worship, and in prayer. The third one, and this one is huge. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. On verse 15, it says, And the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and to be thankful. This verse is the key to having God's peace dictating in your life. The word rule in the Greek means to umpire, to direct, and to control. Let the fruit of the spirit of peace umpire your life. Let the fruit of the Spirit of Peace control your life. Let the fruit of the Spirit of Peace direct your life. See, when you, when you totally surrender to the Lord, when you totally surrender to the Holy Spirit's presence inside of you, He's going to direct you down those fertile paths. He's not going to take you on stony ground. He's not going to take you on hard ground. He's not going to take you on ground that's eaten up with thorns and briars. He's going to take you down this perfect path for your life. But you see, you let the peace of God rule in your heart. And the peace of God that rules in your hearts is the one that actually calls the shots. You ever been to a baseball game? Okay. Who are the ones that are in charge of the baseball game? Umpires. They call what's fair. They call what's foul, right? See, they're the ones that are doing the ruling on the game. The participants are playing the game. Now, they may not like what the umpire says, but they're playing the game. But it's the umpire that directs what's right and what's wrong for the game. See, the Holy Spirit is our umpire. And when we totally surrender to him, he directs us and he calls the shots. He tells us what's right and what's wrong for our life. Now, if you're always walking in the perfect will of God, are you going to be anxious? Are you going to be fearful? Are you going to have any kind of depression or emotional issues in your life? No. Because you're walking in a perfect will of God, His perfect peace is guiding you and keeping you safe. Amen? Mm. Being thankful is actually having an attitude of gratitude. And Paul told us in this, he says, and be thankful in verse 15. He says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are called in one body and be thankful. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, gratitude, let your request be known to God. And what happens? Then you walk in turmoil for the rest of your life and be eaten up like yesterday's lunch. Is that what it says? No, it says, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, how can it guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus when Christ Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father? His Spirit dwells inside of us. So when we're thankful... When we're coming to him with thankfulness and saying, Lord God, you know the situation. I thank you that you've already delivered me from it. The Holy Spirit's jumping up and he's starting to fill you with his presence because the Holy Spirit is Christ's spirit that's dwelling inside of you. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why? The Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. His peace is going to percolate out of your hearts and then it's going to come up and fill your mind too. Anxiousness is the opposite of peace. See, when this feeling rises up and, and tries to come against you, it's an attack directly from the devil. Anxiety, depression, all these worry, fear, all these other things are attacks from the devil. They're not from God. The remedy? You worship, you pray, and you meditate on God's word. I told you that last week. That's how you get filled with God's strength. You worship, worship, worship God. Get on your face before him, worship him. You pray. I shared with you last week what happened to me back in 2000. 
where I was at my weakest point and how the Spirit of God and actually Jesus appeared to me at my time I was my weakest. If you didn't listen to last week's message, I, go, I recommend you go back and listen to it. We have videos on the website as well. See, when we're, when we're feeling our weakest, we need to get on our face before God and surrender our life to Him. And you know what happens? He comes and He fills you with His peace. God's peace, is, is, it's something that you just cannot deny that is yours. You can't deny it's yours because Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. He's already given it to us. It's about, it's about understanding how to walk in it. See, now you, when you're thankful, you the attitude of gratitude, you're not thankful for the sickness that's coming upon you or trying to come against you. No, you're thankful that you paid for my sickness so I don't have to live in this. Now, sickness, get out of here. And you're not anxious about it either because you're not going to worry about it. Jesus took care of it. I'm not going to worry about it. It's not mine. I got this bill due next week. Well, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you've given it to me. I'm not worried about it. Move on. I've got his peace filled up inside of me. See, when, when, we, when we come with an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude means that we're so thankful that he's already given us everything we need. That's the attitude of gratitude. The fourth step. Meditate on God's word. Verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, the importance of meditating on the Word of God becomes, that where it becomes a part of you is huge in this. God's Word has tremendous power and authority. God's Word will never come back void. Amen? It means that it will accomplish what He set it forth to do. God's Word is a part of you. You become a part of it. Out of the abundance of your heart, then, the mouth speaks. See, the more that you're spending time with God in His presence and meditating on His Word, it's going to be very difficult for you to be speaking out the doom and gloom garbage of the worldly situations. Because what's happening is that you're, now you're not focused on the world, you're focused on God. And when you're focused on God, God in, God out. If you're focused on the world, world in, world out. The world is garbage. God is good. Pretty simple. World bad, God good. I can talk caveman. Devil bad, God good. Okay? The, the, the issue is, is that, what's that? Oh, mm. Don't get me off. <laughs> God is good. And he doesn't give us anything bad. But the world wants to put all kinds of bad stuff upon us. And the reason it wants to is because the devil is the God of this world. And he wants so much to get us off track. So when we're focused on the world and all the lusts of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life, we're going to fall into the trap of loneliness, despair, and doom and gloom. You're not going to have peace of God in your life. The only way you're going to have the peace of God in your life is when you're meditating on Him. Meditating on the Word of God. <sighs> See, when something comes against you in an attempt to steal your peace and joy, you worship, you pray, you meditate on the Word of God. I want to go back for a second. When Jesus wa wa went into the wilderness for 40 days to fast and to be prepared for the ministry, we're told that the 40th day after having eaten nothing for 40 days, that's when the devil came at him to tempt him when he was at his weakest point. Their first point says that Jesus was hungry. So the devil comes against him. Oh, you're hungry. Well, if you're God, command a stone to be bread. And Jesus said, man shall live by the word of God. Then the devil took him up on a pinnacle and says, well, if you truly are the son of God, throw yourself off of this mountain. And then he quoted Psalm 91. He said, he'll send his angels charge over you to protect you. And Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord thy God to your test. Then the devil, we're told, took him up on a high pinnacle and showed him the kingdoms of the world. Now stay with me on this. When the devil's showing the kingdoms of the world, he was saying, all of this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. How could the devil give Jesus something if it wasn't his? The devil is the God of this world. Okay? Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God only, and him only shall you serve. Now these three responses that Jesus quoted were all out of the book of Deuteronomy. They're all the word of God. See, this is the importance of meditating on the Word of God.
When something comes against you that tries to destroy you, you quote the Word of God to it and it will destroy it. Because the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Two-edged sword, cutting even to the depths of the marrow. In other words, what God's Word is, it's capable of slicing and dicing everything that comes against you. When you get so full of the Word of God, you're going to be like uh, uh, one of these Japanese chefs that are able to slice and dice the food in front of them and the devil comes at you. you, you know, you're, you're loaded with Ginsu knives in your spirit because they are the weapons of God. And you're able to go ahead and slice and dice anything that comes against you. And when the, at, anything tries to come against you, you take out the Word of God and the Word of God's just going to demolish what's coming against you. You know, people have asked me, how do you stay, how do you not get sick? The Word of God. I spent years studying and meditating on the Word of God. And when I got these truths into me, and, it, and it, it clicked in 2007, I haven't been sick one day since then. Not a cold, not, a, not anything. And I won't get sick. And I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, I'm telling you this is my testimony. And Revelation 12 says, we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. This is my testimony. Anytime something comes against me, and it does, it tries, I quote the scripture at it and I tell it to leave. See, the word of God is incapable of returning void. It will accomplish what he set it forth to do. And you know that, that Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword? That two-edged means two mouth in Greek. So when we're speaking the word of God, we're actually speaking God. Whoo! Where is all authority? In God. And you know, he gave his word above himself. Mm. There's so much here that I just don't have the time to get into in detail today. But it's important that we meditate on the Word of God. Now, we talked about a minute ago about the shoes of the gospel of peace. See, with the shoes of the gospel of peace, it enables us, because when we understand that the way that the shoes of the soldier are created, we're able to plant deep in whatever's going on. When you have the more Word of God into you, the deeper your spikes go. You're able to dig in, and you can try to push somebody, and you're not going to move them because they have security of knowing that the Word of God is in them. And the peace of God gives them that security and that safety. And then it enables them to grow vigorously. Whew! It's good stuff, isn't it? The fifth part. Worship. 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 I'll say it again. Worship. Paul said, teaching and admonishing each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. When you have God's word deep within you, it actually becomes part of your worship. Do you know a psalm is a pious song? It's in reverence to our deity. It's divine worship. That's what a psalm is. It's a pious song. Reverence to deity, it's divine worship. Now this next one, for those of you that have been around for a while and been in the old southern gospel type of churches, when we worship in hymns, it's not that little red hymnal book that's in the back of the pew. Songs that were written in the 1800s or 1600s to old antiquated beer drinking songs. That, I mean, the words of those hymns are wonderful, but the tunes, they, they were put to the modern songs, the modern melodies that everybody was familiar with. And most of them were beer drinking songs from the saloons. We don't realize that. But because they did that so that everybody would be familiar with the melodies. They were able to sing the songs because everybody knew the beer drinking songs. A hymn is actually a song based on scripture. Oh Lord my God, you deliver me from my enemies. You go around singing that and you watch what happens to you. You watch how you become filled with the fullness of the peace of God in your life that nothing's going to come against you. You are my rock, my fortress, and you I trust. You walk through. Oh Lord my God, greater is you that is in me than he that is in the world. You become filled. I'm feeling it right now. Woo! I'm digging in. I'm digging in. Because when you're walking, and you're walking in the fullness of God, the peace just that surpasses all understanding just gets a hold of you. And it surrounds you. And it fills you. And it makes you firm and established in his word. Mm. This is why worship is so important. 
a spiritual song is a song divinely inspired, redolent of the Holy Spirit. How many of y'all are familiar with the term redolent or the word redolent? I wasn't. I had to look it up, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Redolent, you're going to love this. It means full of the fragrance of. Ooh, this is good. Put that next one up if you would. Redolent. Mm. Worshiping God with reverence, singing scripture in praise, full of the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. Wow. This is what's inside of us. The Spirit of God is inside of us. We're able to walk and singing spiritual songs, singing songs that are full of the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. Whew. I'm ready to get happy feet right now. This is good stuff. I don't know if you're getting some out of this, but I am. I want to recap. There are five, the five things. Recognize God's peace is already inside of you. Don't go looking for something that you've already got. Do you know how many people act like a dog trying to chase their own tail? We go around in circles trying to get something that's already a part of us, but we don't realize that it's a part of us. As the elect of God, it's already inside of you. Number two, put on the garment of the fruit of the Spirit. Number three, allow the Holy Spirit to umpire your life, to call the shots of your life, to direct you. Number four, fill yourself with the Word of God. And number five, worship God in spirit and in truth. Mm. The reason that this is so important to recognize what is already inside of you is because we tend to look for things that we already have. One of the most embarrassing times that I had was I was looking for my sunglasses one day. And I was walking around with them on my head like I am now. You, ever, you know where my glasses are? Who took my glasses? All right, where are my glasses? Somebody give me my glasses. Where are they? All right, which one of you kids? Dad, look on your head. Thank you. <laughs> See, we, we go through life trying to get things that we already have. And we don't know that we have them. It's already a part of us. We've got to realize it and walk in it. The peace of God is already within you when you're born again. Why are we trying to get something that we already have? We just have to know how to nurture it, how to walk in it, how to develop it in our life so that we're living a life of peace. Oh, Whew. this is good stuff. This is good stuff. Do you know that there is a reason that a lot of born-again peoples, peoples, yeah, a lot of born-again peoples, I'm having a real good day with my grammar today. There's a reason that a lot of born-again people struggle in this. They struggle with turmoil, with anxiety, with depression, with worry, or anything that's in direct opposition to the peace of God. And the reason is, they don't know what's inside. They don't know that it's already there. See, they're trying to obtain something they already have. Before Jesus went to the cross, he told his disciples something that they would later understand. In John 16, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. See, the peace of God is inside of us. But when we go ahead and wrap ourselves in the Spirit's presence, we're in it. Whew. Amen? In this world, you're going to have troubles. But Jesus is our peace. The Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of you. And we're told to put on the garment, wrap ourselves in the protection of the Spirit, to be filled with his peace. See, if we're focused on the ways of the world, turmoil, anxiety, depression, and every other emotional issue is going to come at us and it's going to try to knock us off of our feet. 
And what happens? When we're focused on the world, it's like play, going out and playing golf without golf shoes on, like I told you. We get out there, we stand up, and we're being able to push around. We're doing the moonwalk all the way back. But you see, when we have the Word of God firmly planted in our hearts, we are dug in. And there is nothing that anybody can do that's going to push you and move you. And when you know that you're securely footed, ooh, peace. And then you're able to grow vigorously. Oh. Mm. They all come so by surrendering our fullness and letting the peace of God rule in our life. See, most people today's time, they tend to be carnally minded. And carnally minded means that we're focused on what's going on in the world we live in. What our five senses, what our mind, our will, and our emotions tell us, what we see, hear, eat, or taste, touch, and smell, our five senses, we tend to be directed by that. And Romans 8, 6 says, but to be carnally minded is death. Why is it death? Because when we're focused on what's going on around us, how is it possible you're going to be able to walk in the fullness of the peace of God? I texted my middle daughter who lives in Tampa because I saw an article yesterday and I said that oh, apparently Obama is um, going to put 10,000 Syrian refugees in Tampa in Clearwater. And I texted her this article and she said, well, there's a few that are there now, but the governor's standing against it. And that's why well, I didn't know if you saw this, and I'm not trying to scare you. I just need you to be aware of what's going on. See, if, if she were to fully, you know what she did? She wrote back and says, well, you know, no, they're not going to let it happen because that's, there's too affluent of a community over there, and they're not going to let it happen. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be negative or anything, but I said, well, you know, it is Obama we're talking about here, so who knows what's going to happen. The thing is, though, is if we were to focus on that issue, that's going to cause such a stir in that community. Now, I'm not against Syrian people, but the people they're bringing in have known terrorist ties. And when you bring in terrorist ties, what is the purpose of a terrorist? To cause terror, to cause fear. See, if you're focused only on the world, you're going to be given into fear. You're going to be looking at the world, and it's going to grab you and keep you in a state of bondage. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Life and peace. Whew. Think about this, and I'm going to close. You're focused on what's going on in the world. All these things are coming against you, and you wonder, why am I so upset? Well, because you're carnally minded. To be focused on the Spirit of God. His peace is already in me. I'm going to let that peace rule my life. And I know that the, my God supplies all my needs. And that, as His Word said, He sends His angels charge over me lest they dash their foot against a stone. I'm not even going to stub my toe. So there is nothing that whatever comes in this world is going to happen that's going to hurt me. See, I'm founded deep in God's Word. I'm dug in. I got peace. I got peace. Do you know when the Ebola thing was coming in? Oh, it was Ebola in the, that they brought to Atlanta last year or so? I made the statement that I want to go down to the hospital and I'll just walk in a room without any protective gear on. I, I made that statement to my wife. And I mean, I'm not boasting. I just said because I know that, that I'm protected by God. And she goes, don't be stupid. <laughs> don't put God to the test. It's like, oh, yeah, there is that, isn't there? <laughs> but you see, I know I'm so secure in my relationship with God that I know no weapon formed against me will prosper. There's nothing that's going to, do that's going to come against me to hurt me. And the reason I know that is because I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I've got God's peace so much in me that people that are around me, they know I don't worry about anything. I mean, I, I see some of you several times a week. Do I ever worry? No. I worry about the workout, but I don't worry about anything else. I complain about the workout, 
But what, I, what, I, what it is is I don't worry about what's going on in this world because I'm so deeply grounded in the Word of God. And I've got the gospel, the shoes of the gospel of peace on, and I am dug in. I'm sensing right now in my spirit that some of you are definitely struggling in this area. You're struggling in this area with the fact of having God's perfect peace directing your life because your focus is on what's going on in your world. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. What are all these things? Every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift. See, when you seek first the kingdom of God, you're looking inward at that spirit that's living in you, the Holy Spirit. And with that is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control. What about you? <laughs> What's that? I said gentleness. <laughs> Wayne is my spell checker. Okay. Guys, I want you to live this because the world we're living in right now is a world that's full of trouble. And when Jesus said, in this world we will have trouble, it's, it wasn't any more relevant than it is today. The world is an evil place. And we can't focus on the world. We need to focus on the voice of God. We need to focus on the Spirit of God Allow him to bring us in the full deliverance. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've given us the ability, Lord God, to live with a life full of peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding that you've given us in the hearts. Continue, Lord God, to fill us with your peace we come to you and surrender fully to you. Holy Spirit, quicken us with the fullness of who you are. And may the fruit of your Spirit grow into that hearty crop forever direct our lives. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the 